Good evening, everyone. My name is Michelle Storms. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm the executive director at the ACLU of Washington. I'm pleased to welcome you to yet another virtual flights and rights for the ACLU of Washington. Thank you for joining us. Tonight, some of our panelists and I speak from the occupied territory of the Coast Salish people. And tonight, we also have a speaker joining us from the occupied territory of the Ohlone people, what many of us know as the San Francisco Bay Area. Remembering that indigenous people were lied to, treaties were broken, and land stolen, we're steadfast in the commitment to fight for justice for all. This recognition names historical injustice and is a step toward honoring indigenous people and having a larger conversation on decolonization and reconciliation. Tonight, we're here to talk about school safety. As students and teachers around the country prepare for a truly unique school year, in the middle of a pandemic. The quieting of campuses has given us time to reflect. No school shootings while students are at home. All the school interactions look different. So we have a moment to ask ourselves, what is actually safety in schools? What is it, what is it really to be safe in schools? What educates, nurtures, and grounds the whole person, the whole student? What do we need to do to protect every child fairly and equitably? All students have a right to education and we're working for more effective approaches to build positive school environments and help students, even if most students are learning remotely this fall. In the absence of in-class instruction, school discipline is still real and the school to prison pipeline is still real. When students finally do return to the classroom, we want to be closer to realizing equity in education. So as we examine the role of police in our daily lives, it's time to also reevaluate the need for police in schools or lack thereof. Black, indigenous, Pacific Islander and Latinx students are disproportionately disciplined, suspended and expelled from school. Students with disabilities are disproportionately excluded. Students who have been suspended are three times more likely to be in contact with the juvenile justice system within a year. King County rolled out a new vision for adult and youth detention that includes eventually closing the downtown jail and converting the youth detention facility into community space and programs. Today, youth detention numbers are down to 21 and by 2025, youth detention will be converted to therapeutic and community space in King County. We are so grateful to the community advocates who tirelessly advocated for this change. We have a long way to go in addressing generations of structural supremacy and over-policing and over-incarceration of communities of color. We're continuously working with partners toward a new definition of public safety that does not rely on policing at school or anywhere else. While the future vision develops, we'll continue to hold law enforcement accountable for excessive use of force, racially biased policing, the squelching of protest, and many other ills, again, at schools or anywhere. Okay, let me step back, do a little quick housekeeping, and then I will introduce our wonderful speakers for tonight. So our flights and rights events, as you know, if you've been here before, are typically hosted in breweries and event spaces around the state, typically at KEXP 90.3 FM or KEXP.org. In addition to KEXP's generosity and support, the in-person flights and rights events are sponsored by local breweries. So if you check out the chat box, you'll get a link to support our partner breweries. Okay, so now back to school. First, we'll hear from Kendrick Washington II. As the ACLU of Washington's Youth Policy Director, Kendrick fights to keep young people in schools and out of prisons and jails. He works with policymakers and community members to replace punishment-based approaches with positive, preventative, and restorative approaches to eliminate pipelines to mass incarceration. A Northwestern University School of Law graduate and former adjunct professor, Kendrick has been a civil rights attorney with the United States Department of Education in the Office for Civil Rights and a public defender in Boston and New York. Kendrick was a sergeant in the United States Army and a veteran of operations enduring in Iraqi freedom. Next, we're, next we'll hear from Shade Smith. Shade was a public defender for seven years and transitioned, to, transitioned into private practice with Smith Law in September of 2019. Sade received her JD from the University of Illinois College of Law and has served as the criminal justice chair of the Seattle King County NAACP, Schools Out Washington and Washington Women Lawyers. 
She was a Washington Leadership Institute Fellow in 2017 and has practiced criminal, civil, and family law and is federally barred as well. During her time with the NAACP, she has led and facilitated monthly free community legal clinics presenting on criminal system reform and racial equity. She has presented at schools, organizations including Microsoft, and for the Washington Initiative for Diversity. In addition to individual advocacy, she consults on criminal system reform. Sade advocates for wholesale abolition, decolonization, racial, gender, differently abled, and LGBTQ rights, and equity in education, healthcare, and employment. Free the land, free the people, Black Lives Matter, Trans Lives Matter, Reparations Now. Her most recent project involves pro bono representation for protesters. Check out dismantle.us. I'm also excited to have us be joined by Damian Davis, no one else. Damian is a staff attorney for um, uh, Juvenile Re Rehabilitation Institutions and the Reentry Project at Team Child. Um, a graduate of the University of Washington School of Law. Damien is a storyteller and an attorney who represents young people in Washington's juvenile prisons. Born in Denver, he grew up in the East Bay and Mississippi, living currently in Federal Way with his wife and daughter. Lastly, I'm thrilled that we're joined by Kai Korber, our first virtual flights and rights speaker to join from outside of Washington State. Kai is a Parkland shooting survivor, technologist, mental health advocate, and founder of the mental health nonprofit, Societal Reform Corporation. Kai has made appearances on various television shows like The View and The Daily Show, and has been featured in dozens of publications, including Insider, People Magazine, Time Magazine, and The New York Times. Kai is currently a rising sophomore at the University of California, Berkeley. His current focus is on launching tech projects, which focus on mental health, public safety, and tech for social good. As usual, audience, you can jump in with questions whenever you like using the question or feedback space in the Q&A line. And you can also check the chat box for important li links and other details from us to you. So let's get started. Thank you so much, all of you speakers. And Kendrick, if you'll take the floor. Um, great, thank you, Michelle. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Um, I'm mostly excited to hear from the um, other amazing panelists that we have. Um, here, so I'm going to try to keep my opening remarks as brief as possible. Um, there really is no discussion about school safety without a conversation about police and schools. And police and schools have a number of names. They're called CROs, they're called SROs, they're called safety officers, but whatever you call them at core, they're sworn law enforcement officers and should be visioned as such. And to understand this conversation, we really have to understand how they've sort of altered the landscape of schooling. Um, to put it in the simplest form, police and schools have led to an increase in what we know as the school to prison pipeline. So I don't wanna assume that everyone knows what that means, but in the simplest terms, the school to prison pipeline is a term that was coined to explain how the rise of zero tolerance policies in combination with massive increases in um, police officers and schools has disproportionately funneled brown and black youth from public schools to juvenile adult jails and prison systems. Um, many of these children have disabilities or histories of poverty, abuse, neglect, and would actually benefit from additional education and counseling service. Instead, <laughs> they're isolated, punished, and pushed out. So, you know, to be brief, just to put it in perspective, in 1976, the year I was born actually, 1% of schools had sworn law enforcement officers. By 2016, that number had swelled to 48%. I'm not a mathematician, but that's about a 4,700% increase. And to put that into even more perspective, when you think about the hottest growing growth fields in the, in the country like IT over the last 20 years, that's only increased by 48%, right? So between 1999 and 2005, the federal government awarded $753 million to schools to expand the use of SROs, CROs, police, and other safety officers. Since the Parkland shooting just a few years ago, states and federal governments have spent over a billion dollars on school SRO and police safety programs. Now, I know the panelists today will be answering questions, but I just want the audience to think about this for a moment. Pretend that you 
Jeff Bezos and you've got a billion dollars to invest in this very moment. Who among us would invest a billion dollars in a service model that has consistently failed for the past 44 years? And in this case, not only has a service model failed, but it's actually created a harm that's costing us even more money. It's time to divest from schools, cops, it's time to divest from school police and reinvest in the future of our most vulnerable population, our youth. Thank you. Shade, please. Welcome. Well, thank you for having me. Um, I'm briefly gonna discuss what is going on in the local movements. And it's important that the community recognize that all of the progress that we're seeing, especially most recently, is the result of tireless community effort and work. And just to name a couple of the, or a few of the organizations that are in Seattle, Community Passageways, Creative Justice, No New Youth Jail, Decrim Washington, King County Equity Now, Choose 180, um, and there are a number more, and these are BIPOC-led organizations. So if we're talking about where progress is and where policy changes at, it's on the community level. And it's important to recognize that because we don't need, um, one, people outside of our communities making policies that are gonna keep us safe, but two, we don't need to wait for politicians to make those moves for us. They are informed by us, we are not informed by them. Um, in the local movement, this was actually something that was really led by students. Uh, just as recently as June 3rd, um, Rainier Beach High School students all organized and they walked out um, on a virtual class session. They walked out and about 100 of them did. And with, by June 10th, Seattle Public Schools agreed to divest from SPD. And so students made their voices heard and they had five clear demands, hold police accountable for abusive behavior towards black students, eliminate the presence of police in all schools, implement restorative justice and de-escalation tactics, in, um, in all schools, urge school districts to fire all staff members with racist anti-Black reports and in racist police violence and defund police. So again, when we're talking about how we orient policy and what we're going to do, we need to be talking constantly to the people who are most impacted and students are the most impacted by this and they recognize the patterns um, and how they're being treated by police in schools, you know, that exactly mirrors how communities being treated by police in the streets. It's um, I thought it was interesting specifically that Superintendent Juno, so the third was when students walked out on the ninth, um, there was a message sent and the superintendent was acknowledging anti-blackness, was acknowledging um, the history of school to prison pipeline. So the language that was used in that letter to community and to parents was the same language that students were voicing. Um, in addition, after the year, we hope that it extends further, but there is so much more support and help that could be provided by community that one is way less expensive and two actually provides healing for um, those most impacted. Thank you. Thank you, Shade. Damien, welcome to this Zoom stage. We'd love to hear from you now. Thank you, Michelle. I think the last time that you introduced me or worked with me on a speaking thing, it was my graduation from UW Law. So it's good to be back. Um, what am I here for? Uh, nothing as grand as everyone else. And I appreciate standing on the shoulders of all these titans around me. Um, I think I'm just here as myself. So about me and a bit of story time for you all. Um, I grew up in the East Bay where you're at now, Kai, um, both in Oakland and then some of the East Bay suburbs. And I, when I was 14 years old, I was arrested for the first time by a school resource officer. And I can remember when that happens, I was caught for smoking cigarettes on campus, right? And if you can imagine, you can't tell right now on the Zoom thing, I'm a, I'm a pretty small guy and I was even smaller then, you know, I'm 5'5". Five five, and I had this big police officer escorting me to, to the office and I knew I had these cigarettes in my backpack, right? And I had this brilliant idea that I'd be able to get rid of them real quick so that I could avoid some consequences. And the moment that I staked my hand into that backpack, that officer saw me as a threat and thought that I might be reaching for a weapon. Took me down, he broke my nose, in the middle of a ton of other students. And I wasn't afraid for the physical harm that was happening. I was humiliated. 
because that was one of many times for me as someone who was arrested several times and did quite a bit of time in adult and juvenile jails that I could see so clearly the power differential between police and me, right, a child at that time, and that it was on display for everyone else. So I bring that to the conversation a little bit, and now, as you know, that wasn't the end for me. Um, I became an attorney, and right now I work with incarcerated young folks in the Washington prisons, um, so I'm thankful to be in the same situation but with a different role. But now having grown up a bit, you know, I, I'm also a father and now seeing this system in, in yet a different perspective where I have a 14 year old daughter who is beginning to encounter these power differentials herself. And this idea of school safety um, is becoming very real for, for me. I had a conversation with some of my friends at Team Child not too long ago in light of the recent movement to defund police, to remove uh, police from schools. And some of the parents in the room, myself included, were wondering, you know, what's, where, where does safety come from, if not from these police? And we know that uh, the statistics will bear out, in fact, that police officers don't make it uh, more safe. But nevertheless, um, we're having a discussion of what are we gonna do about children killing each other in schools or police killing children in schools. And that's a binary that I don't wanna confront. We're gonna to have to figure out a different conversation than that one. Well said, thank you so much. Kai, welcome to our ACLU Washington Flights and Rights from Berkeley, California. You have the floor. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, the, the one thing I really want to talk about is, um, you know, the way mental health plays the, plays a role in, you know, the whole um, school to prison pipeline dynamic, because ultimately, if students don't believe that, you know, the people that are supposedly there to protect them from, uh, um, you know, any kind of negative circumstances, they see them as a threat to their personal safety, the way that affects the learning environment is obviously very negative and doesn't create a very conducive uh, and positive experience. So I think what, what we really need to discuss here also is the fact that school resource officers, when placed on school campuses, really enforce a culture of fear, um, anti-blackness, and PTSD among students. And that directly, um, you know, that, that can be seen in, in a lot of ways as a divestment away from our most valuable resource, you know, which has been said time and time again is the youth. Um, because we're, we're really destroying entire communities from an educational perspective by placing students in these, um, these boxes of intense fear, of intense stress. Uh, so, so I think that whole, that whole environment is really just not conducive to public safety, should be done away with if we really want to protect ultimately what we're all after, which is the health and safety of ourselves and our, our children going forward. So, you know, between um, my belief on, on the mental health ramifications of school resource officers and then my work in you know, tech for social good, I decided to take my, um, my work in tech for, uh, tech for social good to really say, how do I come up with a technological solution for you know, the uh, abuse of power that police have in these kinds of environments and on the street level as well. And so I said what we needed was an artificial intelligence that could really rein in police misconduct as it was happening, um, you know, so, that the, so that they didn't have like this whole, um, this, this whole feeling like they were all powerful and like they were the um, they were the law in the circumstance, which is really um, what happens, you know. Because when you speak to um, you know police officers and district attorneys, they'll say, you know, the only time that they that body camera footage is ever really reviewed and things like that, the only time where they're um, really brought in for certain issues is when it's you know when attention is brought to it. Um, so you know this really just sheds a spotlight on every single encounter. Uh, as opposed to only the ones that people are seeing publicly. So um, a lot of the work that I do is to really make sure that, you know, every um, negative circumstance gets inequality of justice reaction. Thank you so much, Kai. And it's so powerful because you've had a, a, a real life experience of a safety in school question where school really was not safe. And so one of the things that, um, I can't help but think about is what does it mean to be safe in school and, and what do police bring to that? And I actually 
want to, um, with that thought sitting there, go to Sade for a moment and ask about this question of violence by police versus violence from individuals, non-police, whether it's students or someone coming onto campus or whatever, like uh, the distinctions that you would make around that with regard to safety for kids. In any conversation about equity and social justice, there's always the kind of pitting of, you know, community versus the authoritarian overseer. And when you talk about individuals, like I was a public defender and I still do criminal cases and like the, the amount of harm any one person can do is limited, right? Like even if you have the worst person, like as far as the worst behavior patterns in history, there's not that many people harmed as opposed to if you had a state sanctioned and state funded entity that is protected and has a huge power disparity, how much harm could be done by a police department in a number of months if they're not, you know, there's not correct oversight. So it's important to shift the narrative away from what are we going to do if somebody gets away with an alleged crime in a school? It's like that the potential harm of that will never be outweighed or will always be outweighed by the harm of police and the impact that they will do. Um, as Kai was saying about just students with as far as behavioral issues, PTSD, the impact of anti-blackness, the threat of violence within schools. And so um, we have been conditioned to imagine that we need an outsider to tell us how to behave when society did not always exist that way. And when we depend on community, when we resource community, and when we help each other, we learn that behaviors that people determine to be criminal do not exist as nearly as often. And so when people are safe, secured, and supported, those issues go away and you have an environment where people can grow and be healthy. And it's important to talk about these types of conversations in an impact versus intent lens. Um, a lot of the policies that we discuss are always going to have the best of intent, right? Like, of course, after school shootings started happening, then they wanted uh, police in schools because they thought it was going to keep people safe. Well, the reality of it, that it doesn't keep people safe, it harms people more. And so we have to think about the impact as opposed to getting caught up in the weeds as to what people wanted to happen. Thank you for sharing that, Shade. So um, coming back to that, I don't know the answer to this, right? So is the reason that law enforcement is in schools because of school shootings and the fear of that, or is it something else? Because I'm just not really sure that I actually know the answer to that. And and I have a follow-up to that. And I'm looking at you, Kendrick. So um, I hope you can, you know, you may not have a definitive answer, but I would really love for you to just weigh in on that. I think the the question of why law enforcement is in schools is complicated it is it is multifaceted um the popular answer is school shootings right but we really didn't see what they're calling this proliferation of school shootings until the late 90s and the early 2000s um but the police presence was already strong by that point so it's not the school shooting you know, if you ask me, I believe it originated um, in the 80s with the rise of the crack epidemic, with the criminalization of black and brown individuals. And then of course, in the 90s with the rise of the, the fallacy that was a super predator and the need to have zero tolerance policies in school because you can't have zero tolerance without the police, right? If it's zero tolerance, then the number one perpetrator of zero tolerance punishment are police officers. So if you're gonna have zero tolerance, you're gonna put police officers in schools. Um, I think there are a multitude, I mean, the, the media certainly plays a role, right? Because there have been numerous studies, numerous articles, there's a ton of that out there with a three second Google search that shows you crime isn't even on the rise in this society. And just like crime isn't on the rise in this society, neither really are school shootings. I mean, they're a real thing, they've happened as Kai can tell you, but despite this, I think as Sade sort of alluded, it's rare. And so the impact of this rare situation compared to the impact of the police in schools just can't be overstated. And I think, I think fear, I think fear is the, is the original reason. Yeah. Um, and I think it's fear of brown and black people as we've begun to rise in this society. So thank you. And I know that was like not a softball question at all. So I appreciate you taking that on. So in thinking about safety, I really am thinking about the whole person. And so when I hear Damien say that the biggest piece of the impact on that experience you had at 14 years old, you didn't fear for your safety in that moment, but the humiliation that you experienced was really very 
for in the forefront of what was happening for you and you know as we think about the mental health piece like what is safety around our mental health right and so you know really i would invite um either damien or kai or really any of you to to speak to that because i think that um damien's story illustrates an absence of safety for your well-being in that way I'm happy to share a little bit. I, I don't know a ton about mental health resources as Kai um, has promised to share with us and I'm excited to hear about it. I think for me, um, the whole humiliation or feeling safe at school basically boils down to one thing and that's Kai's already alluded to it, which is presenting a safe, secure learning environment so that our children can do what they are there to do, which is learn, right? So that doesn't just include free from physical harm or the threat of physical harm, but also intellectual harm. It means things like making sure that our curricula are culturally competent and culturally humble so that everyone is represented in the history books that our children read, which was not the case when I went and I'm sure it's not the case now. Um, it also means being, being able to survive in school. We know that a lot of students who attend the schools around where we live um, will see services such as food services that they don't see at home. So for me, yes, it is about a whole child. And so Kai, I would really love for you to speak to that too, because I know that you have some feeling about what the placement of police and schools represents for the mental health and mental wellness of students and what it what it creates for the culture of the school well you know i think particularly in disadvantaged communities you have um, the schools are underfunded to begin with so you have um, this huge gap in you know the kind of knowledge that's being presented which already presents the, the children that are going through that institution with uh, limited access to higher education right so you have that framework against them. Then you have this other framework, which is, you know, you're, you're placing um, police officers in, onto their school campuses so that, you know, not only can they make them feel unsafe by, you know, because they see that, you know, police officers not only in their neighborhood are, you know, can be, uh, you know, for lack of a better word, you know, terrorizing to their community as far as, you know, different kinds of raids. Um, and overall, to put it quite frankly, a lot of these people are, um, are a part of white supremacist groups as well. So I would say that, um, you know, between the, the terrorism element of that and being afraid of an institution that has been against the black community from day one, um, from the 1860s, you know, and, and being placed in a, a very um, limiting institution as far as educational resources go, I think um, that whole situation really puts people in, in, a, in a state of, um, you know, feeling like their, their whole world is against them and feeling like they're, um, they're a disadvantaged person. So it, it, takes, it takes away from um, a different kind of self-esteem element. It takes away from a, a safety element. And it takes away from a, uh, an opportunity perspective of that person. So I think as far as uh, the mental health resources go, we can't think of resources, we can't think of safety without considering the mental health element of the, of the spectrum because the mind is the person. So there you go. Thank you. So um, I have a couple audience questions I want to get to, but just before I do that, um, uh, I have a, a, something else that I want to put out. And part of it's for Kendrick and part of it's for Sade. Okay. So um, it's hard for some people to imagine what's because police have been in schools long enough now and have been a, enough of a presence in so many different venues, locations that um, it's hard for some people to imagine um, what it looks like, what safety in school looks like without the presence of law enforcement. Um, and uh, what sort of, um, so part of the question is, what, it, what is the alternative that we share uh, or, or how do we talk about um, what safety looks like in the absence of them? And then I think the second part of that, which maybe Shade would want to speak to is um, community, advocacy and activism around this, what it looks like to center those voices and um, the ideas that the you know, community wants to bring into this conversation as well. Um, so that's what's up there. 
Sure. Um, and this is probably the most common question we get, right? Well, if we get rid of police, how are we going to keep our schools safe? And I think there's a fallacy in that question because the schools aren't safe with police presence to begin with. Like, let's, let's just clear that up. Like, the overcriminalization of children for childlike behaviors um, is quite possibly the most dangerous thing that a child is going to experience when they walk inside the hallways of one of our schools that are starting to, to resemble carceral institutions with metal detectors and limited free speech and limited Fourth Amendment seat search and seizure rights. So it's not that schools aren't safe to begin with. But when we're, we're talking about, like, let's take Spokane, for instance, which invest 2.1-ish million dollars annually in their SRO program, um, but yet we're, we're in a state where we don't have enough counselors and nurses and therapists in our schools. Now, the recommendation for, for therapists and counselors and nurses and things of that nature is about 250 to 1. Washington's lagging behind at about 490 to 1. One, one counselor for every 490 students. Students, the police aren't making students safe because there's not, a, there's not a crime influx to begin with. And you know this because when you look at the data, here's what it shows. When you, when you, put, a, when you put police officers into a school, right, they say th there's an increase in the reporting of the crime. And that's because these police officers are vigilant and all they're trained to do is see crime where there's mostly childish behaviors. So there's this increase in crime, right? Now, you would suspect after a police have been present for a year or two that there's going to be a deterrent effect and that that's going to decrease, but it doesn't. When you have a police officer there, the same number of, of crime is still occurring. So the police aren't having the impact they need. But what the studies do show is that when you have therapists, mental health counselors, nurses, and all these people that create a positive school environment, when you have a positive school environment, graduations go up, bullying goes down, students are happier, happier students feel safe. The idea that the police are creating safety is a myth. Even if you took them away and didn't replace them with anything, you haven't created a more dangerous situation. You just removed the danger of the police. Sade, please add to that. I was just really moved by Kendrick's statement. I don't, <laughs> I don't know if I have much else to say, but in regard to um, centering community voices, what Seattle Public Schools did, and this is something that is to the credit of community because community was demanding to be heard, is that they um, met with, you know, PTA and parents and families and students and got suggestions. And that's how they came to the end conclusion, which was cut the contract with SPD for the next year. Um, so anytime there, I think what happens in the system is there's so many bureaucratic processes and it's like, well, you have to go through this step through this step. And at the end of the day, all they need to do to, is listen to people who are directly impacted and those people have the solutions. So it, it needs to be continued and, um, just touching on Kendrick's point, the whole idea of policing, policing creates a need for itself. Um, as Kendrick was saying, there's not a decrease in the incidents, but we should also see this in the recidivism rates. If you have community programs working with students directly, if they do get in trouble, there is way less of the, like the students entering back into the carceral system. There's just so much more support and mentoring and help. And a lot of this, and again, you know, quote unquote criminal behavior, any type of behavior that we might not necessarily want in schools or that just is criminalized because schools are criminalizing children, um, there's always going to be a cause and police try to treat a symptom and they don't treat the symptom, but they are addressing a symptom, which is the end result. And if you're not gonna address the root, you're going to see the continued behavior. Damien, I think you wanted to add something to this. Thank you, Shadi. Thank you. And I'm probably going to go out of the bounds of this conversation now. I've heard a lot of attempts to answer the question, how are we going to create these safe schools, right? And I don't have one either. And Sade, I think correctly, uh, said that we should be asking people who are harmed by these institutions the most for the solutions. For me, there's a, there's a very specific question, which is, what am I doing as a father and a member of these impacted communities, or what could I be? be doing? Where do I not have enough power to do something and where can I get it, right? And I think that a lot of our communities are asking themselves the same questions. 
we, we are talking about the school situation in America, right? And we're talking, for me, this conversation is about this American individualism. And we know that we have a lot of myths in this country that define who we are. The individualism, the patriotism, we don't talk a lot about community. We have been more recently, we talk about communities of color, we talk about community solutions, but we haven't talked about what that actually looks like in the community for the individuals that belong to those communities. And that humiliation is a strand that runs not just from child to child, but it runs to families, parents, and their extended families and their community members. So for me, when we're talking about solving this problem, I am wondering how we are going to get the people who have this power, which is police, their employers, the government, to give that power to someone else, which is us which may look like, and I'm not in charge of any of this stuff, and there's discussions that we should be having, it should probably include more participation from parents and community members on school sites, not just community organizations, which are fantastic. And probably most of my greatest heroes work at places like Community Passageways, Urban League Seattle. You have fantastic mentors, but I would like to explode that even more. And that's where we're outside the bounds of this conversation. We're talking about things like systemic racism. We're talking about oppression. That's, that's the whole thing, right? So we need to talk about capitalism. We need to talk about why parents and community members don't have free time or resources to show up at schools, right? I'm talking about universal basic income. I'm talking about mandatory cuts to the work week so that parents have to go <laughs> tend to their children, because we can't pretend that no one is responsible or everyone is responsible for children when all of that is untrue. What we've said is that police are responsible for children unless you have them directly under your care. And that's been shown so many times to be unacceptable. Thank you so much for that. And I just wanna say no, not out of bounds of the conversation because the reality is we can't get to the place we need to get to without addressing the things that you've that you've raised and one of the things that i was thinking about as soon as you said well it's not just the community organizations it's the parents it's the families the guardians the caregivers etc and i was thinking yeah and the reason that we don't engage with those folks is because the system is not set up for that to be possible and you already referenced it you know people have to work and they have all the different things that they have to do so I mean, if we really want to think about it, we got to figure out how do we reshape the system so that it actually serves the function and, and you know, again, foregrounds the families. Um, so anyway, much appreciated. Um, I have this great, great question from the audience that um, I suspect uh, Kendrick knows the answer for sure. Others of you may as well. Um, and this is really important to put out because the question is, are there any special experience or training standards that cops have to satisfy before they can be placed in a school? Have to? No. <laughs> no. Yeah. I mean, it, it, there are no requirements. Um, and if there were a requirement, because I fear that that might be the follow-up question and I don't support keeping stop cops in school, but if there were a requirement, it would be go get a child psychology degree, yeah. probably at least a master's. And we know that's not going to happen. So no, there are no requirements. These, these aren't specially trained school cops, right? Like they don't go through the police academy and learn techniques for dealing with children. They learn techniques for dealing with adults and those they would call criminals. And then they bring those techniques to your place of learning and education to your sons and your daughters. Yeah, not only that, I mean, um, one of the things that's true is, and this varies completely from district to district, um, what, how they even define their role and interact with the kids and the families. And there's everything from, is this uh, officer friendly, just trying to help you through a rough moment? Or is this an interrogation that you actually should have counsel for, right, around different incidents that happen in school? So there, there uh, is a complete lack of standards Again, I don't think we're asking for standards, but um, it's a great question and it's important for families to know that. It's, those folks are not coming into the school with some sort of specialized uh, 
young people focused, mental health focused um, approach. Um, and did anybody want to add anything to that before I go on to the next one? Because I got a couple more audience questions. Yeah, go ahead, Damien. To me, it doesn't matter. Um, I'm so tired of thinking that throwing trainings at people is going to change things. The police are not responsible for my child, I am. And that means that I have some sort of duty and I need to figure that out. But I also want to get these police off her back too. Um, we, we know that things like implicit bias training can precipitate an upward blip in implicit bias. And that can have drastic consequences for individual children in these locations. Kendrick, you talked about Spokane, and that brought to my mind the more recent thing that happened with Officer Sean Audi, who brutalized a teenager right in the middle of, I think it was Shadle High School. I lived in Spokane for nine years, and, and that's horrible. These errors aren't good enough because we can't hold police officers accountable. And I'm not talking about with the law. All of us have moral duties, and that's my belief. We have them as individuals, as family members, and community members, and we need to actually focus on recognizing our moral duties outside of the legal context. Thank you. Um, so another person brought this up that, uh, so in their district, it's actually not the school district that funds um, the law enforcement in the school, it's the city. And the city's approach has been, this is to uh, deter gang activity and school shootings. Um, so uh, the question is, is there a, first of all, um, I think I know the answer to this, but uh, what are the panel's thoughts about uh, SRO's effectiveness in deterring gang activity? It's a lot to unpack there. And then also just it, for people who want to do this advocacy, in some cases it's the school district, but in other cases it's a different body that is funding that. So if you have any comments about that. Um, and I don't know who would like to start with that. So I'll look around. Kai, please. So when it comes to you know the notion that school resource officers are going to be uh, you know a force of deterrence against uh, you know gang activity and um, you know schoolyard violence and you know police shootings and or um, school shootings and things like that, I think that you know with the exception of school shootings, um, the presence of police really just presents a relabeling of things that would have happened anyway. So if someone if a schoolyard fight happens, oh my God, it must be gang violence. If you know X Y Z happens, then oh, it must be this criminal charge. So it just presents another element of labeling that forces kids into the system that don't need to be there. So I, I feel that um, for me that that's the the notion that that's going to be a, a deterrent force against those things that are being created by the force that is you know supposed to be deterring it. I think is is completely ridiculous. I mean, 100% uh, agreed with Kai. The, the answer is no. Police aren't a deterrent on the street. They're not a deterrent in schools. And, you know, just sort of feeling sort of what Damien said, like issues like gang violence, those are community issues. And I know everyone wants to think about it as a law enforcement issue, but there is something happening in the community. There is something at core that, that a community is struggling with and dealing with. And again, as noted by Damien so eloquently um, earlier, community issues need to be addressed with the involvement of members of the community. And these police officers aren't members of any community I've ever been a part of. Go ahead, Shade. Yeah, please. Um, the, the criminal system in the US is about, I believe $182 billion a year and free college for all is 47. Um, and so, if we take, if we stop policing people, if we stop investing so much in harming people, if we started resourcing community, as Damien was speaking about earlier, like capitalism and this whole struggle for constantly trying to survive, and then it's like, okay, well, parents aren't available. Um, you have a whole different reality in community when people have the resources that they need to take care of each other. So we need to be defunding places and investing in community to see the changes that people actually want to see. Um, thank you. I'm glad you mentioned some numbers because um, I think 
uh, uh, Kendrick, I know you were uh, think talking about costs associated with um, school resource officers and particularly uh, as against what it would cost to have uh, school psychologists, nurses, um, family support, liaisons, people, whatever. Um, do you want to speak to that a little bit? And then I have a final audience question that I think that will be a good one for us to close on. I mean, there's two costs, right? There's a financial cost, which I, you know, sort of reiterated in the beginning where I talked about the billion dollars that's being spent. It's the, you know, what is it, almost $140,000 that it costs to incarcerate a youth um, annually here in Washington. Um, it's the 2.2 million in Spokane that they're taking away from teachers and students to, 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 to put uniformed or non-uniformed officers as they're trying to switch over to now into schools. But like the real, the real cost is the stability of the educational environment. Like that, that's the real cost. Like we can look at it from the capitalist perspective and that's what it's going to take to get some conservatives on board. Then by all means, we're happy to break that down for them. But the the cost is the loss of this generation. This like the the loss of their innocence, the loss of safety, the the mental stability. I too have been stomped on at the foot of a police officer, and it, it was exactly as Damien described it. I had never been so humiliated to be in that position, on the ground while people are walking by and staring. You know, in my life, like that's a cost that we can't quantify um, into dollars, and and it's the real cost. Um, that actually makes me think of something that I would love for Kai to address, which is how can we promote um, a more inclusive culture of mental wellness on school campuses? Yeah, you know, um, I personally believe that by fostering, you know, a, uh, a culture of, you know, inclusive discussion, you know, in terms of the word inclusive meaning different peoples discussing issues that affect their communities and bringing that information to, you know, uh, the large, the, the overarching administrative body that's, you know, making the decisions. Um, I, I think really discussion as far as, you know, making sure everyone is aware of every possible circumstance or how everything affects every community is going to be a big part of presenting um, you know, an atmosphere of mental wellness for all parties involved. Because right now what we have is uh, we have a couple of people who have a couple of experiences making the decisions for everybody without really fully considering, um, you know, what's happening to the minority or um, to some members of the majority who, um, who may be concerned about, you know, X, Y, or Z. So, you know, if, if we're getting those, um, if, we're, if, we're including the if we're including minorities and people who are of uh, different opinions, of us um, in the decisions that we're making going forward, I think we can almost guarantee that we're gonna be creating a more safe environment. Thank you. You know, something I was thinking about, we, uh, ACLU Washington did a report on police and schools, and now this report's probably almost three years old, so some of the data is outdated, but one of the things that I found really stunning about it is that there were all these incidents that had taken place that were really nothing. I mean, honestly, Damien having, cigarettes of course that was against the school rules right but you weren't you know no one was going to get killed or you know no, nothing like the worst thing that could happen is that your lungs were going to be harmed by that and yes that needed to be addressed right but did it need to be addressed in that way so one of the things that i saw or, or really felt when i read so many stories of you know maybe a kid having frankly just a hard day and maybe you know snapping back at the teacher or whatever and what ended up happening when law enforcement got involved is like everything got blown way 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 out of proportion and it really felt to me like that is exactly the definition of the school to prison pipeline and and what it is that we have to fight against is this fact that you had cigarettes at school one day or you yelled at the teacher yeah of course it was wrong it was inappropriate it was breaking the rules but it set up a system where um, 
you know, it wasn't like in the old days, whatever those were, where you went to detention for half an hour after school and then it was all cool. It's like now possibly it's getting referred over to juvenile justice system and all these things are happening that ultimately take a kid who's having a hard time making a bad choice and leading them into actually seeing themselves as criminal or, you know, getting engaged with that system. So that feels like a really strong harm to me. And one of the things that uh, some of the, uh, a couple different people in the audience have put out, um, one saying it from the perspective of being a teacher, but other, the, another person saying, I think just from the perspective of students and families in general, is what are some of the key messages you all would recommend that students and families and educators can deliver to their school districts, their administrators, their school-based leadership teams to bust the myth of more police equals safer school. Um, and to actually move in the direction of all the things that you, Damien and Kai and Sade, Kendrick, that you have been talking about here. So if you have some suggestions for students, families, educators, what are the messages they can bring forth to do the advocacy that they wanna do um, about this it would be greatly appreciated. Well, you know, I, I think when it comes to the placement of, um, you know, busting the myth of, um, you know, whether police and schools really improve the, you know, the safety quotient of a, of a school, um, I think educators and administrators really have to ask themselves, you know, number one, um, how is the placement of these officers going to affect the student population, right? And I guess you can, you can measure that, um, that encounter by, um, via the reputation that police have with certain members of, you know, the United States community. Uh, whether it be black and brown people versus, uh, you know, Caucasians, uh, and see, you know, listen, okay, um, how, how if, if we have a mostly black school and we're placing, you know, school resource, uh, school resource officers there, you know, what is going to happen statistically? Are we going to create a system of, you know, school to prison pipeline issues, or are they always going to be magically safe for some reason? But, oh, we've been labeling things as, you know, gang violence, and, you know, we're over-criminalizing the students. So we, they really have to recognize that um, you know, the idea of safety when it relates to, um, you know, the placement of police is not as cut and dry as, you know, uh, placing them there creates safe, uh, creates safety. It really creates problems and it creates the uh, enumeration of problems you didn't even know were there because they weren't there. They were created by the body that you placed there. So I, I believe that that's what they have to consider. Thank you for that. L love to hear. Oh, yeah, go ahead, Kendrick. I was going to say, I'd love to hear from everybody about that. I think that we're at a point in society where we recognize that facts don't always persuade people, right? The, the facts are out there. You can label me or call me an expert, but someone who spent an hour on Google and reading some reports could have, could have brought to you much of the same things that I said to you here today. What's going to change the minds of administrators and these school officials is the rise of parents and students um, in the ways that Sade noted um, earlier in this conversation. People want to keep their jobs. People want to know that they're wanted and welcomed. And when enough students and parents rise up and show up at these school board meetings, show up at these city council meetings, protest, stand up, boycott, make their voices heard, um, people, people listen and people need to vote like they're like they want this too, I, I think is po quite possibly the other thing. So I would just simply say that rising up and making yourself heard is the best way. It doesn't matter if you have all the facts straight. If, if 800 people go to a school board meeting and they say they don't want the police, it doesn't matter why. Your community is spoken. They don't want it and your job depends on that. Thank you. Um, Sade or Damien? You don't have to, I'm just looking at you to make sure I'm not missing anything. <laughs> I was waiting for Damien to go. Okay. I agree with Kendrick a lot, except for the voting thing, because I've never really figured that stuff out. Um, for me, most problems, at least the moral solution to the problem is standing up for and fighting for what you believe in. 
And that, of course, presupposes that you need to figure out what it is that you believe in. So if you believe all this stuff is a problem and that you don't want this in your school, then I would suggest that you find other people that feel the same way or you try to talk to the people that love you who will give you enough grace to tell them that story to try to convince them. And once you have that, to bring that to someone else. If you're in the minority and you can't bring 800 people to a, a board meeting, as Kendrick suggests, I can guarantee you that stories are very powerful and that there's a storyteller in your community whose job it is to teach you how to advocate for yourself if you don't feel that you can. And that might be a nonprofit, it might be just some, some person. Um, I don't know who that is for you, but it takes work, right? Work needs doing. And I think, Damien, um, you know, one thing that's really powerful about what you're bringing, like you have lived this as yourself as a youth, and now you are a parent of a teenager. And I'm sure that informs all of it, right? Uh, so I don't know if you have anything else to add from that perspective. Very briefly, um, because I did talk to my daughter about having this conversation um, just a little bit ago, and she had some things uh, that we agreed were good ideas. For me, I, I work for a law firm who represents young people in the community and in prison. And one of the dynamics that we see is kids who are excluded from school for some sort of behavior that happened at school. And oftentimes that means that they've done really bad things. They've hurt other kids. And, and those kids have done something like gotten a no contact order from the court. And what happens for the, our clients is they get pushed out of school. More terrible things happen like referral to the juvenile justice system idle hands, all that stuff. Um, what, what having a family and having a 14 year old daughter has taught me more recently is the other side of that story. Uh, my daughter was uh, victimized while at school several times in ways that have extreme health, lasting health impacts. She has multiple traumatic brain injuries from assaults that happened at school. And as parents, um, as, as two attorneys, because my wife is an attorney too, what are we supposed to do? We're thinking, well, don't really know. Where's our community? Do we use the legal tools that we don't believe in? How do we make something safe for our daughter right now, right? And there aren't good answers to that, which is why I'm so heavy handed with this moral responsibility thing and this community thing because I've seen both sides of the table and neither yields firm results. Thank you so much for bringing that up. And I'm so sorry that you have to deal with it in that way, but I'm grateful for the, the perspective you bring as a result and the way you even approach that problem you know, with your wife, like how to address this. And that's at the crux of it, right? One of the things that we know about um, people who are in the criminal legal system, whether juvenile or adult, is how much people have also experienced being victim survivor as well as maybe being cast in the role as perpetrator or having perpetrated. And um, it, it, it's a complex situation that requires solutions that are not the ones we are currently applying. Um, Sade, I wanna give you a chance to add to that and then I'm gonna have us close. Okay. Um, I was just thinking off of Damien's point, um, transformative justice, restorative justice. Yes. There are um, alternative ways to, and it, just as Damien was saying, it goes back to uh, communing with people um, that you are, either people attending the schools, just developing that support system so that there is a way to address these issues without involving the police. Because again, the police are going to continue to commit um, and perpetuate harm. And to Kendrick's point about um, People don't care about facts. In 1929, President Hoover commissioned the Wickersham, or ordered the Wickersham Commission. And essentially it was like, okay, we have an issue. Police are corrupt. This is around prohibition. And in 31, they released a report. And it was talking about all of the ways that police lied and did all these problematic things and that we need to get a, you know, a, a system in place to check up policing. And at that time, the commission did not conclude, oh, we need to have police reform themselves. It was, we need to have community alternatives. And this is 1931, and we're still having this conversation. So um, it's an ongoing thing, but the reality of it is, is that police are never going to give us what we need 
um, to be safe in this community and continuing to adhere to that is only going to continue and perpetuate harm. And then we're going to spend a lot more money too. Um, what if we just take the chance and trust each other and invest in each other? And that's, that's really the big ask. Can we stop just hoping that somebody else will fix our problems and start working with each other to fix them? Thank you. That actually is a, is a lovely place for us to uh, close out for the evening. So uh, barring anything else for many of our panelists, I don't see any of you clamoring to jump in. I want to thank you so much for, um, uh, for your heart and passion about these issues and for your deep thinking about it. Um, really grateful to each of you for being here with us this, this evening. Um, as always, so grateful to our audience members who came out and who uh, asked really probing questions and who care enough to show up on a sunny summer evening when our summer's on the wane to talk about something that is really the heart and soul of our future as a society, which always is how we treat our children and how we care for them and how we create an environment and a culture for them in school and everywhere that allows them to thrive as whole human beings with all their foibles, right? So um, also finally just wanna thank our um, ACLU Washington team behind the scenes that keeps this thing moving uh, so that we can be out here talking with you. Um, again, thanks to all of our partners, uh, those represented in the groups here, KEXP, all the breweries, please support, please support all the groups that you have uh, uh, seen and heard about in the, in the chat box. Um, and uh, so with that, I know many people want to go and get in on perhaps other things that might be on television this evening. Um, so thank you so much, everyone. Um, in doing this work together, uh, there is great hope, great possibility, great opportunity for transformation. Um, we may have been talking about it since 1931, but the energy that is happening right now is so powerful and the centering of community is so powerful. So I have hope. Um, Thanks again. Join us September 11 for our next virtual flights and rights. Everyone have a wonderful evening. Thanks. <laughs>